Welcome, everyone. Uh, today is February 12th, 2020. Uh, I'm Dr. Terry Hildebrandt. I'm the Director of Evidence-Based Coaching at the Fielding Graduate University, and we're really excited today to offer our Evidence-Based Coaching Thought Leaders webinar on Making the Best of It, a New Model for Understanding and Building Resilience. And this must be a really popular topic. We have 42 people on the call today, uh, and we have uh, Dr. Susan Auger, who is uh, an alum of Fielding from our doctoral program. She'll be saying more about herself in just a moment uh, and talking about her research as well as practice in the world of, uh, of, of the resilience. So thank you for being here, Susan, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point to introduce yourself in a little deeper way and to uh, begin your presentation. Okay. Uh, well, welcome. So should I share the screen now, Terry, or? Sure, whenever you're ready. Okay. All righty. Well, uh, yes, as Terry mentioned, I'm an executive coach and consultant and an alum of Fielding Graduate University, and I am really excited to be here and be part of this community of practice that really has enhanced um, my experience of coaching and work and the support I have. So I feel like, you know, speaking of resilience, I, this is one of my key supports and communities to do that. So to begin, what I'll do is I have um, a presentation on the PowerPoint, as Terry mentioned, and I'm going to just switch over right now to my screen, screen share. And all right, there we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I am just really excited to be here, as I mentioned. Um, what I'd like to do is make this uh, session as interactive as possible. So in the first half, I'm going to be talking about the context, but I also like to invite some of your input because resilience is something that we can all relate to in terms of our own lived experience as well as our practice. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of opportunity for input there, and then I'll go ahead and review some of the key resilience concepts. And as Terry mentioned, we can um, get into more dialogue and Q&A and some, you know, real-life examples um, as they come up. There's a lot of facets to this theory and to the phenomena of resilience itself. So this session is going to be more like tapas to whet your appetite. We're um, facing incredible challenges and changes on many fronts, individually and collectively, that I think really can um, drive an experience of just unrelenting stress. I see that we have some folks in China, and I, I, I'm sure that you can be relating to that with um, the things that are going on in public health. Um, I want to keep my comments brief here, but I just did want to highlight that the um, Klaus Schwab, if you're not familiar with his work on the fourth industrial revolution, really struck a chord with me in his um, description of the impact of technology and emerging innovations as a revolution. And he really describes with a very broad lens about how it really is transforming entire systems across and within countries, companies, industries, and society as a whole. It's a really eye-opening. And he's, um, his first work was in 2016. And he's published a few other things. And this was even a topic on the latest economic forum. So if you're not familiar with that work, I highly recommend it in terms of kind of a big picture of, of context. So these trends are driving the need for, um, for us to be um, develop our capabilities for continuous learning and agility and how we adapt and transform, as well as resiliency. Uh, I thought it was really striking that the IBM's number one criterion for hiring someone is their propensity to learn. Um, and that's in part because, you know, our information um, and is just changing so um, rapidly and the technical skills that it's much easier to hire people who can learn and then they can teach the technical skills as they go. And I think that speaks to um, Terry's comment also about wisdom. And that, you know, how important being able to cultivate wisdom is versus just being able to obtain knowledge. So what I'd like to do is hear about how this is manifesting in your life. What are some of the stressors that you're seeing in your practice 
um, that's driving the need to become more resilient. Maybe if you could type some things that are on top and, and or possibly in your own life in the chat box. Ontario. Since I can't see the chat box. Yeah, absolutely. So feel free uh, if you haven't um, yet used the chat box, it's on the uh, bottom strip. You can click on chat and, and you can uh, type in any comments you might have. So we have mergers and acquisitions. Okay. Anyone else experience any stressors? Or even if this can help in terms of giving examples as we go forward with the dialogue, what is it that's driving, driving you to want to be more resilient or learn more about resiliency? That's another way to ask the question. Great. It looks like our group's not a typing group today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if you come up with some, uh, some things that come to mind, you can feel free to put them in the chat and we can incorporate them moving forward. All right, so here's another question, which we'll see if you have any more typing inspiration. What are some ways that you're already building resilience in your life? The question is, is how can we tap into it and strengthen our implicit capability? And I think that's really important, especially when people are feeling down and drained, that, you know, there is this innate ability to be resilient and the question is is how can we tap into that and this is where i think um, my theory could really help in term and make a, um, a valuable contribution to helping make the implicit explicit so that we can be much more conscious and intentional about our choices um, and our skill sets when we're coaching and even when we're trying to build and maintain our own resiliency So the theory of making the best of it is really a process for lifelong learning and development. And it explains the ways that people navigate life experiences that involve a sense of disruption, tension, um, or disequilibrium in the best way they can while avoiding or minimizing negative outcomes for themselves and others. It's a nonlinear process with five interconnected stages and then turning points the inner or outer influences that stimulate movement through the process. And can you all see the arrow? Terry, can you see that arrow? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, oops. Um, this lends itself to coaching because there's no right or wrong way. We can use it to quickly assess you know, where people are, whatever stage they're at, with whatever turning points might be involved. And it's a great model for reflexive learning and cultivating self-awareness. Since the process is context dependent, it provides a framework for critical thinking and connecting the dots regarding the myriad of conditions and situations that can affect us that also impact, for example, our relationships, our resources, and our options. The bi-directional nature of this dynamic allows us to examine how we as change agents may affect or influence ourselves and our relationships as well. So this circle on the outer represents the context that we're in and it's, it's bi-directional. So this represents the interconnectedness of all the different concepts. And it's always affecting what we're doing, what our options are, and what's happening within the process, but it's, it, we're also impacting that. So it's kind of always in relationship. I developed the model using classic grounded theory methodology, which involves listening and looking deeply for underlying patterns of behavior in the data. And what I'd like to do now is hit some highlights for each of the stages. So what we've got is we've got encountering. And um, encountering in a coaching session is really the task is, is trying to identify, well, what is it? What does the person want to work on? 
and you intuitively do this, right? And, and also as part of our ICF competencies, you might find yourself asking, well, what do you want to work on today? Or say more about that. Um, how important is this? Uh, why now? Why, you know, why now? Why is this, this conflict or this tension important now? What might happen if you didn't do anything about it? Uh, what would be different for you once the problem is solved? So that's a way of getting clarity about what the person is encountering and then what it is you want to move, work on in the coming home space. So in this stage, the coming home, it's a place for stabilizing, connecting, and assessing. And the arrow right here uh, between the centering and connecting represents our interdependence and the opportunity for co-regulation and support. The circle with the dotted line right here, um, that represents one group, whether it's a dyad or a family or a community um, team or organization within many of other contexts. And that's important to keep in mind because this can be a safe place and it can play a really important protective role even if you're in um, other hostile larger environments. Uh, another key piece is, is that our individual sense of identity, as well as our collective sense of identity, um, are inextricably connected in this. And, you know, if we can get into some examples, you know, later on, we can illustrate that. So some of the tasks, if people are in this stage, that they might be doing is finding or creating a safe place internally or externally. And some of you talked about, you know, doing mindfulness, for example. Um, Cultivating uh, self-regulation, practicing self-care was another, another thing that people mentioned. Um, connecting with others. So there's kind of the going within here and the centering, and then there's connecting with others, seeking validation and support, gathering um, information and resources. Um, and part of that process in assessing might be, you know, personally, for example, like reflecting in the journal, or it might be brainstorming with friends or colleagues or working with a coach in assessing and reassessing one's vision, values, options, resources, and consequences of potential actions. And that ties into um, that, you know, kind of planning and prioritizing for the next stage of pathfinding. Um, so there's many questions, obviously, that you could ask. A couple of quick examples might be um, if, if you're supporting the person, for example, in, um, in centering, you know, what do you do to take care of yourself? How have you bounced back from rough patches in the past? Tell me about your go-to people. And when you do that as a coach, what you're doing is you're trying to assess, okay, what's going on in that person's kind of uh, coming home place? we'll call it. The next stage is pathfinding. And this is where we're ready to take action. In this stage, we have decided on a plan, um, even though we may not have had all the data or maybe we're under uh, challenging or changing circumstances. As you can see, there's three main pathways. There's following a way, making a way, and dead ending. Um, Dead, following a way is where you're following kind of a known or existing pathway. Making a way is blazing a trail that's unique to the individual, and that requires some energy. Then there's also dead ending. Now, dead ending typically is um, you might temporarily delay your process of trying to um, optimize your outcomes and uh, just try to minimize by just getting by, um, or it could be a permanent ending, like, um, you know, deciding to leave a job um, or end a relationship. Uh, there's also checking out that might be, um, you know, like an addiction. So uh, those are the three um, pathways. Tasks in that is really to adopt a growth or continuous improvement mindset. Another task would be um, being flexible and open to turning points that may require a change in action within a pathway. So maybe you're following away and you're running out of steam, so you decide to kind of go temporarily and just kind of just get by 
and then, or, or maybe go home, you change stages and go back home to kind of center and connect and, you know, renew yourself and then begin again. Coaching questions you might ask include, well, what happened? So if the person is like falling away and they just hit a wall, like, you know, what happened in that process? You know, what did you try? Uh, what were the consequences intended or utter otherwise? Um, what if you took a break and, and decided to maybe change a stage? Um, what if you just sat for this with a while, uh, for a while? Or what would it be like to quit? And really kind of exploring what's going on with that person. The completing stage or the, the moving on stage, which is completing the process, happens when you're ready to move on, which can um, be done either by choice or by circumstance. And typically what will happen is a person will step back, assess the encounter in the whole, and um, kind of review their experience, you know, in, in toto. So you can either move on by making peace, uh, which involves, um, it might entail like reconciling discrepancies between our initial expectations and what happened or considering the context. And it's like, well, maybe I started out, you know, preparing to do this, but then these other things happened and I, you know, I think I did the best that I could, so I'm ready to move on. Um, the other way a person can move on is by splitting. And this involves unresolved issues or unfinished business. And it may happen because, um, you know, maybe you didn't have an opportunity uh, to finish some unfinished business or, um, or maybe you just, you just had to move on because um, the situation, like you were fired from the job and there was absolutely no choice or, um, so anyway, we can go through some other examples, I think, in our discussion. A key task in this stage is to practice, compassion, uh, to practice compassion for oneself and others. And I think that's really important in terms of being able to, in that reflecting process and looking on it as a whole. The last stage is the revisiting stage. And this is really, to me, this, this stage gives me hope, and it's really key to lifelong learning and growth. We can revisit an encounter at any time. Um, and there's four ways to do that. There's paying respects, cultivating wisdom, restoring wholeness, and reliving the past. So some of the, the tasks might be, um, you know, expressing gratitude or uh, using cognitive or reflexive learning to go back and really think about what happened and, you know, with a new perspective now that you've kind of gone through it. And that would be cultivating wisdom. Restoring wholeness might be um, working with your body, for example, and you know, going through a trauma healing process. And reliving the past, which can avoid avoidance, or uh, I'm an escape from the present or the future, uh, here's where we might experience being stuck. So some coaching questions you might ask might be, uh, well, what happened? How did it go? Um, it sounds like you're still working through this. Like, where are you? What's going on? To try to help the person maybe, um, if, especially if there's unfinished business they haven't quite articulated. Uh, another way would be kind of switching the frame and going, well, what could be good about this? Or what are you grateful in all of this? Especially if, if it had been something where there had been involved um, some unfinished, unresolved issues. Um, another question might be, looking back, how did you feel as compared, you know, how do you feel now as compared to when you were going through it? And helping to help that person kind of get a, uh, you know, a different perspective. Um, another thing, another question might be, do you see ways in which you can leverage the strengths and strategies you used in this past situation to meet your, um, to meet your present situation? So if, um, if you're working on an issue and you ask the person, you know, what have you tried in the past? It's, it's 
starting to tap that past experience and bring that forward and, and helping that person resource themselves. So just to help put this thing into motion, I wanted to share an example of a client. Now, she felt like she was burning out and she was getting completely depre depleted with uh, what was now a thriving practice. Uh, and she was really worried because she was afraid it was starting to negatively impact her health and also her services to her clients. Um, she was feeling really overwhelmed, right? And here we are in the coaching session. She was feeling really overwhelmed um, and paralyzed and unable to mobilize herself to take action. So hearing the stress in her voice, I listened really calmly as she began to sort through all of her feelings and thoughts. And in that process, what was happening is I, she started to, you know, through the um, really supporting her and just letting, letting it out and letting it all on the table, she was coming back to her center. And as we began to assess her situation and um, comb through, like, what had happened, uh, one question that I asked her was, well, when did you start to notice the shift? You know, has your practice and your experience of work always been like this? And what, ha what kind of came out, there's a bunch of things that came out, but one thing I wanted to focus on in particular that really helped, I, I think, uh, illuminate this process is she was talking about when she first started her practice, she was in one location, and then she expanded, and she had offices in two locations. And her practice was to schedule her appointments on the hour which was fine when she um, didn't have a full schedule. And as she was talking, one of the reasons that she was scheduling, and she would schedule blocks of time in the hour. And when she didn't have a full practice, she could uh, have the time in between um, gaps to make phone calls, to do her billing, do her record keeping, and, you know, things were going smoothly. And if she ran over, it, was, it wasn't a problem because she had some wiggle room. And what, so what happened was, is as, since she was scheduling on the hour, people were starting to come in and she literally had no room. So if you use this model, what was happening in a particular um, appointment with her, with her uh, client is, the client would come in, they're in the coming home stage, she would, you know, have, do her pathfinding, which is she's doing her scheduling like always, and then the client would move on and, and things would be fine, and then she would start it again with another client. But when she, because she started having these um, appointments back to back on the hour, when she started running, she had no chance for herself, right, in terms of this centering, she had no opportunity to take care of herself or to take care of the phone calls or to do any of her paperwork. So if, and if somebody ran over, then it started squeezing her out. So she had literally no breathing room. It was just like one encounter that would like flow through right to pathfinding, right into doing the session and then moving on and then encountering and then zip with no coming home time for centering. So one of the, um, things that she ended up, we ended up talking about is, well, what would get in your way of changing her schedule? And she said, well, billing, because, you know, they can't bill under, if it's under an hour or something, under 50 minutes, uh, a client can't bill their insurance for the session. So she ended up, one of the solutions turned out to be scheduling appointments for 52 minutes, which gave her an eight minute window in between. And uh, she, another thing that she did was she also decided to close her practice and relocate to another um, uh, and consolidate her practice. But between those two strategies, what she was doing is she was creating space for herself to kind of center and connect um, with others as she needed that was an ongoing issue and then being able to do her, her, um, her sessions. So um, anyway, that was just an example of how this was really helpful about kind of illuminating how she was like squeezing herself out of the stage. So 
another thing that I wanted to bring up before we close is, and we can talk about more examples, but it is this idea about um, resilience having many facets and uh, that there's a lot of different kinds of models for resilience and there's a lot of research on resilience. So here's one model called the five pillars of resilience uh, for those of you that want to, oops, those of you that want to, um, all right, so what is going on with my cursor there? Those of you that want a really great resource for uh, maybe sharing with clients or, or for yourself and learning more about resilience, I highly recommend this Bounce, Bounce, Back, Bounce Back Project website. It's got some great resources about what resilience is. What they talk about is, you know, there are five main components for building individual resilience, and that includes self-awareness, having a sense of purpose, practicing mindfulness, having supportive relationships, and practicing self-care, which many of you have already mentioned when we, um, at the outset of the session. So this is great for individual resilience. But here's why being able to have a comprehensive view is really important. One of the things that they found is that you can have several resilient individuals and put, together, put them together on a team, but that's not going to necessarily make a resilient team. The whole has its own dynamics. And I think another contribution that the MBOI makes to the field and to our um, efforts to build resilience is it provides a framework to understand resilience through a system lens. So there's the research in terms of individual resilience, which is here. There's um, research in terms of, you know, the group resilience. And there's tons of research on family, team, organizational and community resilience as a protective factor. Um, there's also environmental resilience as an example in terms of context. Um, and that directly impacts, as many of you know, who've been through the fires, you know, what's going on. We've seen the, the floods and the tornadoes and, you know, how our environment is impacting individuals. It's impacting our culture, you know, our groups, as well as, you know, all of these systems. Um, the other thing that there's research on is resilience capacity because the other thing about stress that we know is that it's cumulative. So not only do we have to consider what stress we're experiencing in the moment, but what is our, what are the cumulative effects of stressors over time? So even if you have little things that are draining you, like the client who had changed her schedule and suddenly, you know, with back to back, um, uh, sessions, it was totally draining her and it was, it caught up with her. So that's an example of the importance of really looking at a person's context, especially when you're coaching over time and looking at their, um, their capacity of where they're at and helping them step back and go, Oh yeah, that's like putting, helping them connect the dots. And then the other, the other piece of um, literature is the resilience of trajectories. So, you know, there are factors, what's the difference between, um, we find out that there are some trajectories and pathways where people can bounce back at their, you know, at the same place, or some people can um, actually not only come back, but they can actually grow. And that, you know, that's in the research around post-traumatic growth, for example. So I think, you know, why is this important? Um, for having a systems perspective, I think the model helps get, um, keep the big picture of resilience front and center without losing the importance of the system impact on individuals, but also our capacity as individuals and change agents to impact those systems. Uh, in terms of talent development, for those of you that are working in that area, this systems framework can also support the integration of resilience knowledge of individuals across professional and organizational domains. Um, a couple of resources just, you know, to close. Uh, there's a wonderful book that Fielding has put out. Um, Connie um, Corley and Marie Sonnet were the edit our editors and authors. And this is a really great collection of 
original research for um, scholar practitioners from fielding uh, focused on resilience, all different kinds of resilience, individual resilience, as well as organizational resilience and community resilience. Another resource for those of you that are working with teams and organizational resilience, this is a fantastic article um, around how teams flourish under pressure. And then here's that website I was recommending. So what I'd like to do now is open it up. Um, I'll stop sharing. Here's my contact information um, for more information about leadership development programs based on this model. Um, Dr. Chuck Burke, who is my, who's on this call, who's a partner of mine, we've been working together to put together programs based on this model. Um, so with that, I will open it back up. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, what a what a great model, and and thank you for sharing your research and and the resources today. And uh, this was an exercise in resilience for me personally because my computer froze and I couldn't. Uh, mute people or unmute people, <laughs> which I normally do during these sessions. So uh, thank you for your patience as well. So this was like real time, uh, you know, life happens, right? Yeah. Um, I had to actually uh, exit out of a room and come back in uh, to uh, correct that issue. Uh, but we got it under control. So thanks for your flexibility. Um, so if anyone has any questions right now, uh, feel free to unmute yourself uh, and go ahead and ask that question. Or if you prefer, you can type that question into the group chat and uh, we will uh, read your question and, and Susan will uh, address it. If you have any other comments as well uh, at this point, feel free to share those as well. Anyone open with a question? Hello, hello. Uh, this is Chuck. Uh, and, you know, I, I know a little bit about the model since Susan and I have been working together um, with it, and and it has, in my mind, incredible utility and, and flexibility in it. Um, I, I'm wondering if if other people see a way in which using this model, I, I think we saw a really good example of how you could use it in a coaching session, but if anybody has an idea of how they might use it in an organizational intervention, let's say, does anybody have a thought about that? So Chuck, I'm curious, have the two of you had any examples of that where you've used well, it in organizations? Well, well, so, yeah, so far, well, what I see in, in my practice, and Susan does too, I think, is just um, how tough it is. To, you know, mostly in the corporate sector, we do some government, but in the corporate sector, the the volume and velocity, I call it, is, is enormous, and, it, and it's just... Um, it just keeps coming. So I, I see a huge need for it. Um, it's a little hard to, to explain. I, I think we have a couple of, of trainings coming up where we're going to be able to at least take a piece of this and, and use it to train. But I think creating an environment in which resilience becomes a not an afterthought. People talk about it. I hear people talk about it. Um, but I don't see anything being done to actually operationalize it. So I, I see this need um, now and going forward just increasing. So um, I, I think getting people to think about a way of developing organizations in which you embed resilience into it uh, is, is going to be an important factor going forward. Certainly in coaching it already is, but that's the individual thing. And as coaches, we know that sometimes the you know, we can get pretty linear in trying to help somebody without real access to the system in which they operate. So I don't know if that made any sense, but that that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. And I think Susan and I are both thinking about it. Anybody has thoughts on that, we'd love to hear. I'd love to hear. Yeah. And, and Susan, I don't know if you're monitoring the chat room, but there's a, been a few questions for you. Yep. And you're on mute, Susan. Um, okay, thank you for that, Terry. Uh, 
So I see um, a question here about how do you describe the opposite of being resilient? And is it always bad? One, the one thing that strikes me about that is there, the opposite of being resilient almost sounds like resilient is, um, is a trait. I think it's really helpful to think about it as a capacity. Um, and there are particular, um, let's see, this is, this is kind of complicated. So in a growth mind, I'm using two different paradigms here. So in a growth mindset, right, we see ourselves as always being able to grow and learn and to process information and it's connected to our effort versus, oh, a person's resilient or not. And when we think about ourselves as having resilience as a capacity, that kind of kicks us into a mindset, a growth mindset. Um, there is research on traits associated with resilience. So um, that might be um, people being able to, you know, count their blessings, um, having, um, I'm trying to think of what some of the other specific ways are, um, allowing yourself to feel your emotions, um, uh, being willing to talk with someone, um, about you know what you're going through and being open to that connection versus withdrawing. Uh, so there's there's behaviors and attitude and knowledge that are associated with being resilient. The one thing that I thought was really helpful in developing this um, the pathways is that dead ending normalizes the times where you're not feeling resilient and where you're not feeling like oh my gosh I can't do it. So if you recognize, oh, that's just one pathway, you get to go back up to coming home, you're, you don't get stuck in that, that, um, in that place. It helps you unstick yourself to be able to create some movement and refocus. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, looks like we have another question from James. Uh, do you use a team diagnostic to identify stress factors for a team? Uh, you, based on this model, there, there isn't a, an instrument at this point based on this model. There are instruments that can help you do those kinds of assessments. Okay. Do you, do you use any of those in your own practice? Uh, no, I have okay. not. Well, I mean, the Hogan, I guess, is a way of looking at stress and how it impacts your behavior. So I guess that's one way of looking at the impact of stress. Right. Um, stress factors for a team. Let's see. I'm also curious, just to, while, while we're waiting for the audience, um, you know, we do have a lot of our uh, Chinese colleagues on, on the line. Um, what, what advice might you have them for managing the uh, coronavirus situation? Any tips based on what you've learned about resilience? Uh, gosh. I think the, um, the suggestions that people have um, that I'm, I'm looking at right here in the chat about um, really taking care, going back to those five pillars of resilience, really practicing self-care, um, having, making sleep is really important. Um, let's see what else. The, I think the meditation, being able to, uh, another, uh, wonderful body of research is the neurophysiology of what they're learning about the vagus nerve and how that's connected to our immune health and and being able to stay strong so things that um you do in terms of um that really supports you in going to the place that you feel calm and um and secure so whatever that is for you Great. Uh, journal writing is another one that's like terrific and that mm. you can do anywhere because I, I understand that there's a lot of quarantines and people cannot go out. So um, that comes to mind as well. Yeah. We have another interesting question. What was the reason the model was named making the best of it? <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious where that came from. Yeah. 
So um, what happened was, you know, using classic grounded theory, you start with a grand tour question. And my grand tour, 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 uh, grand tour question was how to asking parents about their experience of bringing a child into the world. And contrary to what most professionals talk about of what to expect when you're expecting, parents were talking about, well, what do you do when the unexpected happens? What do you do when, you know, you're, you're bringing two families together and there are different religions or, you know, different geographies or different, you know, different cultures. How do you, how do you blend them together? Um, and what I kept hearing over and over in people's stories is, well, you just have to make the best of it. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, one story about, you know, a mother being sick and, and, you know, her kids were home from school and, you know, all she wanted to do was make sure the house didn't burn down. And for her, that was making the best of it. So that was, um, that was how that came to be. Okay, great. Um, we have a question uh, uh, from Lynn. Uh, what can leaders do to support resilience in their teams? Okay. Well, what I would do um, is I would recommend definitely checking out the um, team resilience article. Uh, it goes in depth into it's it, the authors actually pool their resources for um, creating conditions for resilience and health for, with NASA and the astronauts. And then they took that to the business sector and tried to take those learnings of how do you create that kind of environment and culture. And uh, they found um, a, there's a list actually as part of the article where they have um, behaviors that teams do that um, are associated with resilience before, during, and after events. And they literally go through and list, I think there's like 40 of them, 40 specific things that you can do um, to, for, to support team resilience. So, can, yeah. can you show that page for us while we're talking about it? Yeah, just uh, on your, or, or, or through the, uh, through the, I think it was on your last slide. Is that right? Oh yeah. So let me do screen share. Oh, That'd and be great. Yeah, also asked for that as well. So. Is it? Yeah, that's a great resource. Great. Yeah, it's not quite showing yet, so I might have to click the show screen. Oh, it's, um, oops. Okay, let's. Is it showing now? Yes, thank you. Oops, sorry about that. Great. So if, if, if you wouldn't mind, just leave this up for a moment. We'll mm -hmm. a address a couple other questions. Uh, uh, Bev, would you like to come online and share your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, look, I, I just have really enjoyed this presentation, Susan. Um, and I do really appreciate the way you brought together both the sort of individual and organizational perspectives on resilience because often it's the individual response that's discussed a lot like you know how you do something to meet the need so i'm just sort of wondering about um I th the model i think offers a lot of opportunity to explore organizationally mm -hmm. um how that might sort of play out but I'm just I'm just wondering about um, your thoughts around this idea that you know some of the ways of working today the 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 speed the the expectation the demand is sort of in a way like creating this sort of impossible way of working and that um, thinking beyond not just about how you embed resilience, but actually how organisations are addressing some of those broader issues. It seems to me that your model would also be really useful in that way. So I'm just wondering if you would care to comment on that or have had any used it in that way at all. Um, 
Yeah, Bev, I, I think that you are articulating the growing edge of what, um, what we are all facing. And that's where uh, Klaus Schwab's article or theory about the, um, uh, about the industrial resolution, uh, revolution and the transformation of technology innovations that's driving transformation and how it's changing all of us and our systems and how we work. How we work. Uh, I think that's, you know, just kind of keeping this on the screen here. Helping, we are so in it. And I think when we get really stressed, we tend to get very, uh, our physiology really tends to narrow. So our thinking is narrowed, we kind of like hunker down and we just try to keep on, keep on. And it, it, it's, it's hard to kind of go wide and see all these different factors that we're, um, are influencing us and how we're relating. And I think there's such a bias that's being driven by technology um, to kind of like just forget the coming home stage, go from encountering to pathfinding. And we're, and I think that's where the body of resilience research on all these different facets becomes really important. It's trying to get us as, as individuals and as, as a society uh, to be able to try to see what is different and all these pressures um, are really challenging us to, to question everything that we're doing. It's really forcing us to look at our paradigms and how they're not working anymore. Um, and how we really have to like build in time for um, like a, per a good example I came up with a, a coaching client. We were talking about workplace balance and she was saying, well, you know, that's just, that's a gender thing. And as we were discussing more about that, about like, well, what did she mean about, you know, you know, cause in, in, in her situation, the roles are reversed, right? So she's got um, her spouse at home taking care of the kids and she's fine with kind of living a more traditional, you know, kind of workaholic schedule, maybe, I guess is a way to put it, you know, like just working all the time. And um, so I started talking with her about, I said, you know, that may have been a gender, very connected to gender issues originally, but I think we're at a uh, work, uh, work balance issue 2.0 or 3.0 maybe in terms of, it's now not just about, you know, are we cheating men and women the same, but as human beings, are we giving ourselves the space to have work, pay, work uh, workplace balance to survive? Mm -hmm. And it really is taking on a different level of significant significance, which I think is really being fueled by the technology and our interconnectivity and expectations that go with it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We ha we have one more uh, comment here from Michelle. Uh, Michelle, would you like to ask your question, or we can read it for you? Um, well, let me, let's um, go ahead. Okay. Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, my question is re very similar to um, Beth's uh, comments and uh, um, the question that is uh, from the organization perspective, we are facing all the challenges and we are helping the employee to bounce back. Right? Rather than ask them to um, uh, uh, encourage them to find their own way, what, we, what else we can offer from a company's perspective to help them to get uh, back to track um, faster. Um, is there any um, useful practice or approaches you recommend for a, a trial to do? Well, there's lots of resources um, in terms of uh, specific kinds of strategies for resilience and building resilience. 
I think for you as a co are you asking for you in your role as a coach or are you looking from an organizational perspective? Yes, exactly. From a um, company's perspective, if you are, uh, if your role is being in human resources, uh, what you're going to do? Okay. So, all right, well, I think, you know, maybe just kind of a couple of comments in terms of from both perspectives. As a coach and somebody working one-on-one, -on -one, your capacity to really be with the person even and one of the other issues comes up about boundary issues. What happens if really what's happening around resilience is really connected to other mental health issues that are kind of, you know, in the domain of therapy. Uh, but one thing I just want to emphasize is that as coaches and, you know, working with individuals, your presence and your ability to attune to them will help them Number one, feel heard and seen and validated. And it, what's important for them will arise because it's highly situational. I think from an organizational perspective, from a, from a company's perspective, it's incumbent upon um, people in HR, talent development, to look at the systems and look at the culture in ways that um, take into consideration uh, what kind of degree of resiliency um, uh, do you foster in the culture of the organization. It's, it's kind of like individuals are the tree and the culture is the soil. And you can have healthy individuals who um, might be doing great and have great potential but if they're in toxic soil, it's going to kill the plant. And, you know, it, it works in both directions. But if you have, like, good soil and healthy soil, then you can help the plants flourish. So I think from a company's perspective, part of what we have to really look at is the culture that people are in and the environment and the processes and, and actual structures uh, and, and um, that either support resilience or don't. And you've got to be able to look at both because it's bi-directional. Great. We had uh, one question from uh, another member around uh, asking for a reference. Uh, do you have a reference that lists somatic indicators of stress and ways of dealing with them when using the model? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, one resource that I have found absolutely chuckles smile when, <laughs> when I say this, it's, it's a book for therapists, but it is one of the clearest uh, resources that I've found that helps me understand the somatic process of, 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 of stress and what to do about it. And it's called um, The Polyvagal Theory in Therapy by Deb Dana. Can you put that in the chat for folks uh, if yeah. you have a chance, Susan? We probably have one, time for one last comment. Uh, and uh, anyone else would like to, to say anything uh, before we close and uh, have a, a few announcements? Uh, Terry, I, this is Marjorie. I do have a comment to Great. make. Thanks, Marjorie. Thanks Go ahead. Observation. Um, first of all, Susan, I really appreciate your model. Thank you. And uh, I have a different perspective. Marjorie, we lost you. Somehow your mute went on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Because I, I want to share uh, with you my appreciation for your model. And the way I look at it is almost there's a, there's a, there's a two different, totally different perspective. This model looks to me could be a main, uh, it's like a, a prevention model from the, the potential stress and challenges you encounter every single day. That's if that's the one perspective you're looking at. However, if you, uh, when we looking through the model, you begin to aware that there are steps that you can identify, you can engage, you can find your way out and you can kind of set goals moving on and through various steps, okay? Uh, 
And the end I thought was really important is the turning point. When, wherever there is a challenge, there's always an opportunity. So I think at the end, you have those two arrows showing here are the steps so when you are challenged and are stressed, you will go through this and you can find your way out through coaching or steps, questions, and processes. Yet at the same time, you are aware of those, then you have the opportunity to get to the turning point. And so you do this often enough, it's like building your own immunity. So, so it could be a prevention rather than the treatment. That's my, that's my perspective. So I want to thank you for this trend of thought. Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah, being able to recognize those patterns that lead to resilience and support resilience versus the ones that kind of end up in dead ending or, you know, triggers that go there. You can look at those patterns that don't end up with, with resilient outcomes and go, huh, what was going on? And it can help you take preventative measures for the future. Exactly. So you're exactly right. You can use it in the present to figure out what's going on, but you can also use it in part of that planning for uh, prevention, for relapse, for example. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Well, we are a little over time, so I just want to go ahead and wrap up the webinar at this point. And, and uh, Dr. Susan, it's really wonderful to have you here today and share your research and, and your resources. Um, we will be uh, posting this recording on our website, but thank you so much. Uh, and I'm just wondering, how can people get a hold of you if they would like to learn more? So do you, uh, so Terry, first, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity and to be part of this, this community for me is, as I mentioned, one of my resilience supports. Um, uh, should I, sh I can share the screen with my contact information. Yeah, please do. Um, let's see. Uh, so if you want it, more information, let's see, here we go. And, and I'm going to also put post it in the chat. Uh, so it just okay. posted it there as well. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I just really appreciate your participation and, um, and staying with us through the whole session. Thank you. So I have just a couple of quick announcements uh, for those who uh, would like to learn more about our coaching community of practice. Um, this uh, program is part of what we call the CCOP, and uh, anyone is welcome to join that has an interest in coaching. And if you go to our main website, which is coach.fielding.edu, you can see a number of tabs here. One of them is the Coaching Community of Practice. You can read about it and then sign up by clicking the subscribe button at the end and just fill out a very, very short uh, survey, and then we will add you to our base camp. Our base camp is a great place for you to share questions and information, and we also post our upcoming webinars. And there are a number of them uh, coming up soon. Um, our next one will be at uh, the end of this month, February 26th, on coaching women leaders. So we will have a panel discussion. So if anyone is learning uh, or interested in learning more about coaching women leaders, we have a panel of fielding alumni from both EBC and HOD, which is our PhD program, who are going to be talking about that important subject. Um, shortly thereafter, in uh, March 11th, uh, we have another fielding alum, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Knickerbocker uh, from the PhD program talking about tenor, which is a new approach to coaching clients in emotional intelligence. I've personally been using tenor because uh, uh, Jim and Charles are part of my network for the last three years. It's a breakthrough methodology uh, for increasing and managing emotions and improving your emotional intelligence. You'll never see anything like this anywhere else. So this is breaking news, and they are just getting ready to publish their book on this subject. So I highly recommend uh, this webinar. Uh, you'll learn a lot, and, and I, I've been using it uh, for many years now very successfully. We also have on March 28th, another webinar on measuring mindset and change readiness. So uh, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Jody Odell from Europe, who will be talking about her instrument on measuring mindset. Uh, it's a very interesting 
tool and uh, you'll learn a lot about how to, to do that. Uh, and then we will have a, uh, another webinar from uh, Dr. Brian Underhill. He's the uh, global founder of, uh, and president of CoachSource. Uh, CoachSource is the largest executive coaching network in the world uh, with over 1,100 coaches active. Uh, he'll be sharing his research in executive coaching trends, including global pricing. So if you're interested in pricing for executive coaching, definitely tune in and, and hear from Brian. Uh, we'll also have a few more uh, that haven't yet been announced, but stay tuned on our EBC blog uh, for more details. And again, you can watch all of our uh, webinars if you miss any of them by going to our main website, which is coach.fielding.edu. You can click on Thought Leaders, which are our research-based webinars, which is where Susan's um, webinar will be posted shortly, and then our professional series webinars, which are more about applying um, uh, field, uh, applying the learnings from our coaching research in the world. Uh, so these are topics about how people are using coaching to transform all industries. Uh, so we, our last one was on coaching military leaders and veterans, and our coaching women leaders will be posted here as well shortly. So again, thank you all for coming. I hope you will join the coaching community of practice if you haven't already done so. Uh, and that we can see you on one of our future webinars in, uh, coming up uh, later this month. And uh, thank you all for attending, and, and special thanks to Dr. Susan Auger for her uh, wisdom and willingness to share her research today. Bye Thanks. for now. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.